I see love as just showing people that you care or going that extra mile just to show someone that they're important to you. Um, you could do like small little things like maybe buying them like a hot chocolate or a cookie or just being for them when they're having a rough day, giving them a hug and just asking them if things are okay, stuff like that. So when my dad passed away, lots of people brought us different kinds of foods just to show love to us. I think it helped my mom a lot because she didn't have to make meals, so that gave her more time just to do what she needed to do. It took a lot of stress away from her. A lot of people came up to us and said that they were praying for us or thinking of us, and that really was nice to know. A lot of people offered to like have me and my sister over at their house just to give us something to do so that we didn't have to think about how upset we were, and that really made a big difference. When my dad passed away, I was still pretty young, so I didn't get a chance to know my dad super well, but like, I have a couple really good memories of him. Like, often when my mom went out, we'd watch Star Wars movies or wrestle together. It was really fun. A couple years ago when my mom got sick with cancer, it was really scary because, I mean, just a few years before that, I lost my dad. And so I was just really scared and I didn't know if I would lose her. And she was always in bed and sick and that was just pretty scary. So once again, people just came and brought lots of food, just even did little things like hugging us, maybe just coming and like telling us that they were praying for us and that it was gonna be okay. And that just really meant a lot. We had someone who brought maybe like 40 lunches for our school so that we didn't have to make those after school and that was a huge, huge help. So even though I was still really scared about my mom, I just felt so loved and so comforted by all these people showing that they loved us. At first, I couldn't really understand why God was doing this and it was kind of just like, why me? So around this time, I'd started going to the youth at my church, and that's when I really started to feel connected with God and got a better relationship with Him. So luckily, my mom was healed and she was cancer-free, and that was just such a relief and felt like a huge weight off my shoulders. And I was just so thankful for God. I feel like this really brought me closer with my mom because it just kind of made me realize how lucky I am to have her in my life and how thankful I am for her. I love baking and cooking and so sometimes I just like bake or cook for my mom to show her that I love her. I love all kinds of foods like pasta, chicken pot pie, they're all really yummy. And I feel like food's a great way to show people that you love them. My sister, we get along pretty well. Sometimes we bicker a little bit, but other than that, we get along pretty well. <laughs> Me and my mom have gone through so much, and I just think that kind of brought us closer together, and we'll always stay that way. <laughs> through all these sad things, I know that God was there for me, right beside me, and even though maybe I couldn't see it at the time, now looking back at it, I realize that he played such a big role in my story. Well, oh, thank you, Katia, for that amazing story. Uh, and that encapsulates so much of what all of us are experiencing in one way or another. I don't know if you caught it there, but uh, there were like four things that she ment mentioned about, like, what does it look like when the church, when Christ followers are being the church, are being Christ followers, especially on a day like today, asking each other, are, are you okay? 
Is there anything that I can help with? Is there anything that I can pray for? How can I serve and care for you? Brothers and sisters, this is what it means to be oriented towards peace, other-centeredness, the way of Jesus being an unstoppable force of good, of love in the world. And happy Mother's Day. Uh, my name is Jimmy. If you're checking us out for the first time, I'll be your uh, live stream host here this morning. Um, we know that Mother's Day uh, represents a multitude of different expressions of um, f feelings, of experiences. Um, and so we don't say, I don't say, Happy Mother's Day glibly. We know that for, for some today is just like, is, is a pinnacle experience, is celebrating with family, is celebrating with loved ones. And for others, it signals grief and pain and sorrow uh, and the loss of maybe, you know, what you thought was and what is not anymore. And so we want to say, as a church family, there is room, there is space. This is what it means to be active peacemakers uh, in our world and in our community today. And so whether you find yourself in the pocket of, of grief, of pain, we want to say grace, peace, uh, joy to you today in the throes of grief and sorrow. And if today marks a celebration of, uh, you know, connection, we want to say grace and peace, love, mercy, and joy. We're in this together, uh, asking each other, like, how can we best love each other? How can we pray? How can we serve? And this is the marker of our series that we are in. If you're just joining us for the first time, we are in week two of not only our Peacemakers campaign, but also our Peace Be With You series where we're leaning into that very question, how are we present here in our local geographical um, spaces, leaning into being an unstoppable force of good in the places that we live and uh, play and work. And so I'm excited to be leaning into that in a little bit. Like I said, we're also in week two of our Peacemakers campaign. And our Peacemakers campaign is one of those times annually where we lean into active participation in the movement, the kingdom of God in making peace and giving time and energy and money, resources to what God God is doing in and through our church. And so through our Peacemakers Initiative, we're partnering with and serving in the areas of Indigenous and settler rec um, reconciliation, restorative justice, justice work in prisons, and then also humanitarian efforts um, and peacebuilding programs in Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, in Iraq. Now, pause. One of the ways that we can be uh, deeply involved in this Peacemakers campaign. It's not just by giving money, although we'll come back to that in just a second, but it's also by getting involved, like a fundraiser. We're hearing many exciting stories about how people are like auctioning things off, are, are putting on events. I know our Hamilton community, shout out to Hamilton, uh, is doing some uh, art auctions. And so if you need any inspiration on like, okay, Jimmy, enough talking, what is it that I can do? Uh, hopefully this story from Christine in our Brampton um, parish will inspire you. Let's take a look. Welcome to our Peacemakers Telethon concert this evening. I'm Christine Gerber. I'm the pastor at the Meeting House in Brampton. And uh, I'm going to be co-hosting the evening with my friend, Diana. Hey, Diana. Hi. The Peacemaker event that we did last year was a concert telethon. It really involved our entire community, or as many people in our community that wanted to be involved. It involved our children, um, people with different gifts. Uh, we had something for everyone. Christine connected with me and said, I have this idea for Peacemakers. And as she explained it to me, I'm like, yeah, we could do this. And this would be amazing because, you know, it would be a great way for people to be connected. It would be something exciting. The auction part of it really allowed people to get involved as, as they could and as they wanted to. We had a variety of things uh, offered from within our community for the auction. Even some of the rivalry and bidding for some of the items was a lot of fun as well. As we planned and went into it, I really was just hoping that our community would get involved and that we would have some fun together as a community and, of course, raise a little bit of money for, um, for peacemakers. Those were really my hopes for it, and we exceeded them all. Oh, thank you so much, Christine. 
Go and do likewise, brothers and sisters. Uh, if you need ideas, talk to your local parish pastor or, you know, feel free to even email in at info or ask at meetinghouse.com. We want to do everything possible to lean into uh, the season of active peacemaking and giving. Um, I'm excited to share with you that like our goal for this campaign is $150,000 across all of our locations, $150,000. And guess what we are already at? Drum roll, please. please. Okay, it's just me in this room. We are already, uh, we've already surpassed $45,000. So wherever you are, give yourself a hand and give, give, give. Um, you know, this this is the, the like I said the active participation of the kingdom of God together with brothers and sisters both locally and globally that that need support that need our help and so uh, hopefully that was very inspirational and has like started the wheels turning about what you can do locally whether with your family in your workplace with your home church or in your local parish uh, hopefully that's got the wheels turning uh, and that we can meet our hundred and fifty thousand dollars I think we're gonna get it I think we're gonna get it it's gonna be fantastic this would also be the time in our morning where um, we encourage and explain a little bit about what it means to give um, to our church family. And so we'll, we'll use phrases like offerings or, or tithe, but it's really just uh, giving a portion of our, um, of our resources to fuel and support what happens at our church. And so we'll make plain that uh, everything that you give goes to fuel the mission, the work of God uh, in, um, you know, both our local parishes, but across uh, all of our parishes. And we want to lean into this vision that we have of introducing spiritually curious people to the Jesus-centered life through um, a movement of local Jesus-centered churches. And none of that happens uh, without your giving. And so maybe this is your first time. You're like, oh, how does that work? Like, how does one give to a church? I'm glad you asked. You can go to themeetinghouse.com slash give and all of the information is there. Um, maybe you're in a season of life where like, I hear that, Jimmy, I just can't do it. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. Or maybe you're in a season of life where like, this is a good reminder. Uh, so how does one like re-up or, um, you know, start giving again? Same spot, themeetinghouse.com slash give. We are so thankful. We don't say this lightly. We're so thankful to be part of a joyful and generous community because it fuels, like I said, everything that we are doing together as a church. Let me pray, and then we're going to transition to our music through worship and then into our teaching, which is going to be so fantastic. All right, let's pray. God of grace, thank you for your presence here, whether we are, uh, you know, just listening while on a treadmill, whether we're tuning in, um, you know, live online, whether we're sitting, uh, you know, on our couch, uh, or whether we're just getting breakfast going in our PJs. We know that you meet us in the daily ordinariness of life, that you love us by your spirit, uh, and that you intend for us to reflect the image of Jesus. And so we pray that that would be the marker of our gathering here, wherever we find ourselves. We thank you for the generosity of our community. We thank you for the initiative of peacemakers, how we can be an unstoppable force of good in the world through our giving, through our serving, and through these fundraiser ideas. May you continue to inspire us by your spirit. And now as we lean into um, celebrating together, um, engaging in worship through music and teaching Jesus by your spirit, would you speak to us? And so we pray these things with expectancy. And together we say in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. take a moment and acknowledge that God has gathered us here this morning for worship. He's invited us here and I want to thank you for accepting his invitation for us to come together as community this morning. Psalm 34 verse 1 to 3 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And I pray today as we engage in worship that God will prepare our hearts to receive the gift that we have in Christ. And also that the Holy Spirit will just continually transform us 
into the likeness of Christ. If you are able, I would like to encourage you, invite you to stand with us as we worship.
miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Oh, maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Even when I don't see it. Even when I don't feel it, you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. You know, even when I don't see it, even when I don't feel it, you never stop, you never stop. You know, you worship the Lord. Letting go of every single dream Made you wind down at your feet Every moment of my wandering Never changes what you see I've tried to win this war
glory Coming on the clouds with fire The whole earth shakes The whole earth shakes I see His love and mercy Washing Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. I see a generation. Oh, 
But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7. No matter how much one may love the world as a whole, one can live fully in it only by living responsibly in some small part of it. Where we live, and who we live there with define the terms of our relationship to the world and to humanity. We thus come again to the paradox that one can become whole only by the responsible acceptance of one's partiality. Wendell Berry. Mission is provincial. It's local. It's indigenous. It grows in the peculiar ecosystems in which it's planted and so it will taste and smell different in different settings. Michael Frost. Cities have the capability of providing something for everybody, only because, and only when, they are created by everybody. Jane Jacobs. Listening requires trusting that while your involvement is meaningful, you are not the answer. Listening is perhaps the greatest demonstration that you do not conceive of yourself as God and that you honor others as worth listening to. Tim Sorens, Paul Sparks, and Dwight Friesen. We cannot love God unless we love each other, and to love we must know each other. We know him in the breaking of bread, and we know each other in the breaking of bread, and we are not alone anymore. Dorothy Day. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. John chapter 1, verse 14. Good morning.
morning, Meeting House family. So good to see you. Uh, here we are, our second week of our Peace Be With You series. Uh, my name is Quincy. I'm one of the pastors here in Oakville, and I'm happy to be here with you. And uh, yeah, this is week two of Peace Be With You. And I love how Carmen set us off last week saying that this is kind of our sweet spot as a church. Uh, we can spend a lot of time uh, in, our, in our own minds, in our heads, in our imaginations, but there's a, a beautiful thing that happens when we can actually become the hands and feet of the one we say that we're following and be engaged intentionally with some of the things that are happening in our world and, uh, and, and what's happening around us. And sometimes we can get uh, so caught up with all of the things that are happening in a broad sense, in a global sense, that we can neglect what's happening close uh, to home. Uh, where we actually live. As we want to spend some time uh, this morning talking about that, and I'm not alone up here. As you can see, I want to introduce uh, a good friend, uh, colleague, and fellow Meeting House pastor, Steve McDowell, who's, woo, woo, yeah, yeah, for sure, <laughs> big time, uh, who's become a good friend and somebody who uh, I, I'm, I'm getting to know and have so much respect for and, uh, and love what he, uh, what he has to bring to us, uh, a college professor, uh, a third place aficionado, uh, neighborhood enthusiast, um, what else can we call you? Uh, pastor here at the Meeting House. Pastor here at the Meeting House, which yeah. is great. Yeah, yeah, so I'm happy to have you here. And uh, to give us some context, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture. It was in the, in the quotes already, um, but I'm just going to read it again to uh, start us on this conversation of what it is to be uh, intentionally present in our neighborhoods and where we live. Um, it's Jeremiah uh, chapter 29, starting in verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. And find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, and do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So, Steve, maybe it'll be helpful for us if we have a little bit of historical context to, to why this was written and who it was written to, just to get some understanding. Yeah. So, full disclosure... This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture uh, in the whole of the canon. I really find that this is a profoundly rich and meaningful text. And we come to it and we launch into seek the peace and prosperity of the city a lot. Maybe you've heard that passage along the way, and it's pretty meaningful and dynamic. And if that's true and that's the invitation, that's pretty exciting, uh, I think. But there's this whole kind of flow to the passage before we actually get there. And so for some context, the people of Israel find themselves taken over by a foreign ruler by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe some of you are familiar with that name. And so Nebuchadnezzar takes over Jerusalem. And in taking over Jerusalem, he reveals what certain ancient leaders would do when taking over a civilization like the people of Israel. There's different ways that ancient leaders would take over neighboring states. Uh, one way is to endure uh, military action against them and then to enslave them and their population. That's one approach. Another approach we see ancient leaders do is they take over through military action a neighboring state, and instead of enslaving them, they just tax them really heavily. They allow them to have their own kind of customs and culture still, but they get heavily taxed and they're kind of governed from a distance. But what we see in this passage is that Nebuchadnezzar, the leader of Babylon, takes over Jerusalem. What he does is he brings the culture makers, the poets, the artists, the artisans, the decision makers, the influential people amongst the, the community of Israel, and he brings them to Babylon. And the hope there is, is that over time, they would just become good Babylonians, they would become enthralled by the culture of Babylon, the rhythms of life there, the beliefs, the economic way of being. All of these things would become so enticing. So instead of forcing them to become Babylonians, the hope is to fascinate them to become Babylonians. That over time, that maybe through 
osmosis, they would become good Babylonians. And then the Babylonians get the gift of this new people group, right? The assets, the capacities. And this is one way to conquer a neighboring empire is to bring them to yours, to influence them over time, to help them fall in love with this new place that they exist in, and then to get all the benefit of having these new people in your midst. It's a pretty effective form, actually, of assimilation, especially if you have a compelling culture like the Babylonians did, and, and, and they're certainly notable there. But what we observe in this passage is that the people of Israel are hearing something locally amongst their own people, these local prophets. These local prophets are saying, don't get too comfortable here because ultimately there's another home for you. This is temporary. This is not God's plan for you to be here. God did not bring you here. We are going to be ultimately moving somewhere else. And so don't get too comfortable in this space. And then we hear this prophetic word. That message sounds familiar though, right? Don't get too comfortable here. Yeah, this is yeah. not your home. That's right. The, the great by and by. So there's something similar, uh, similar to what I think we hear and also other religious That's right. uh, groups will hear is that don't put too much emphasis in the here and now. Mm. It's all about the by and by. So it's interesting that that doesn't sound like a bad message. It may sound like a familiar one. Yeah. But Jeremiah has something else in mind, I think, is what you're getting that's, to. That's right. I mean, God's pretty direct through the prophet here that, that you're to stop listening to those people because they're not speaking on God's behalf and that actually it was God who carried them into exile. So it wasn't by accident that they find themselves in Babylon, but that God himself moved them into this new city into this metropolis, and that he's inviting them to make this their home in a very real and dynamic and tangible way. Build homes, plant gardens, get your fingers dirty in the task of cultivating the land. Maybe plant things that you're not even going to see grow and flourish for years. Mm. Experience your place in this very holistic way. Because this is the place I've carried you. This is the place where I've placed you. And this is your home. So stop listening to those other voices telling you to dream of being somewhere else. Because this is it. As far as you're concerned, this is where you're to be. So how then would this uh, particular passage be a good framework for us understanding uh, how we can be present? Mm. Or, or how it applies to us? I think there's a pretty intentional flow to this passage. So again, the instinct is to jump to the seek, the flourishing, the peace, the prosperity of the city. And that's kind of the apex of the passage, but there's a few steps to get there. The first is this invitation to move in, I think, that we see in this passage, uh, that you're to actually move in and take up space in a locality. And we have New Testament affirmation for this idea. We celebrate it at Christmas in the Incarnation. Uh, the Word became flesh and blood, and in the words of Eugene Peterson's uh, version of John chapter 1, the Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. neighborhood. That the incarnation, there's a particularity to it, that God comes to us in a very personal and intimate proximity, disarming proximity, and that actually can shape our own sense of being a community who exists in the places and spaces that we live out our lives in. The, the fancy theological way, the seminary way to say this, would be that our Christology informs our missiology, right? The idea that the way of Jesus, the way that he comes to us, actually shapes how we move out into our places and spaces, right? Discerning what God's up to there. Because here's the truth, friends. God has been active in our neighborhoods long before we got there. It will be present and active, stirring up dynamic and interesting and fascinating things long after we're gone. And so part of our invitation here is to move in, right? To, to, to plant gardens, to build homes, to give our kids away in marriage, mm. to become part of the fabric of that place. And to, to ultimately, in that passage, also concludes with the idea that we, we, we tie up our well-being with the well-being of that place, right? That's part of that Jeremiah 29 passage is that, that when the locality is thriving, your proximity to it is so close and so intimate that you feel that too. Mm. When your neighbors are celebrating, the proximity is so close that you celebrate too. When our neighbors are mourning, when our neighbors are unhoused, we feel that too because we've tied up our well-being with the well-being of the city or the particularity of the neighborhood that we actually exist in. So there's this invitation to, to move in, 
But then there's also this invitation to become attached. And I think that's where we start to get into the build homes and plant gardens piece, to become attached. Because there's something powerful about our senses, right? When we utilize our senses, think about some of your most visceral memories. When you think about some of your most visceral memories from the past, there's a good chance that you're using multiple senses, right? There's probably a smell, there's something you're seeing, tasting, touching, right? Our senses are incredibly powerful. And over time, when we use our senses in a particular place, we can develop place attachment. So I think one of the reasons that God invites the people of Israel to plant gardens, to get their fingernails dirty in that cultivation, is because in doing that, they would have these sensory experiences, and over time, over the span of years, would develop a deeper attachment to that place. Because what good would the people of Israel be if all they did was sit in their homes and talked about stories of old, of how good it was when we were in Jerusalem, or stories of the future, where God ultimately might take us? What good would they be for their present neighborhood and context? How could they possibly seek the flourishing of their place if they hadn't really moved in, if they hadn't really become a part of the fabric of that place, and if they weren't utilizing these senses, which over time would cultivate this kind of attachment to a locality? And then it's from that vantage point, you move in, you experience the place holistically, and then seek the peace, the prosperity, the welfare, the well-being of the place that God has carried you into. Because at that point, you're uniquely positioned, I think, to start to discern the needs and longings and hopes of the places and spaces we've been carried into. It takes that kind of presence and attentiveness, and maybe over the span of years, in all that we're talking about today, I feel like that's an important caveat to make, is there's no immediacy in this. This is a long road. This is a hard to pitch uh, because ultimately the invitation is years of faithful presence in a place discerning what God might be up to there. Some of the most fascinating stories that I hear about what God's up to in different neighborhoods tend to happen around the five to seven year mark. Now that's not to say that it won't happen quicker for you, but often when you hear a message like this, you think, I'm going to go into my neighborhood. By next week, we're going to have a block party. We're going to have a sharing economy where we share skills and resources and capacities. All of our assets will be used. And most people who jump to that, and that's my instinct as well, to, to think big, to scale quick, uh, we tend to feel disappointed. And then we become the worst enemy of any kind of real neighborhood movement because our neighbors never match up to our expectations of, right. of what should happen in our places. And so... Again, to get to the passage, this move in, become attached, and then from that vantage point of really being a known character in the neighborhood and knowing what's going on there and listening and, and being attentive, then we begin to see the opportunities where I think we can leverage our own skills and capacities in a way that seeks the flourishing, the peace, this holistic well-being of our places, while also receiving something from our neighbors. That God's actually at work in our places and through his grace is at work through our neighbors, wooing us to himself through the people around us. And so we don't only bring something, but we discover that God's actually in the neighborhood mm -hmm. waiting for us there. And we discern that around the tables and the tension of it all. And so we're not just bringers of good news. We do have a story to share. Yeah. Uh, but and we're going to receive something. And sometimes we, we get that twisted where we think that because we're uh, people who follow Jesus and somehow we have the goods on the goods, mm. right? Like that anything good that's, uh, that's coming is brought by us yes. as opposed to, like you said earlier, is that God is already at work. He's at work everywhere, mm. even when we don't think that he, he is there. Mm -hmm. But to then uh, find those people of peace or uh, recognize where God may be at work. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the slow thing, that's not really encouraging, Steve. No, it's slow. Yeah. It be slow, yeah. Yeah. So maybe we can get into some, some practicality. Like, mm. so, so, so what does that look like for us that are wanting to be incarnational? I love that you're talking that, that yeah, there, there is something there for us in Jesus showing a model of not just speaking to us from a, a smoky mountain, mm -hmm. but actually, I love the way uh, Eugene Peterson said, but actually moves into the neighborhood and becomes present with us. Mm. But what are some maybe practical things that we could be thinking about in our spaces? Yeah. Well... The first one, I think, would be a, a posture, and we were talking about this just today, mm -hmm. uh, this idea of embracing a posture of disruptability. It's not, it's not a word, so don't go looking for that word in the dictionary. It doesn't exist, I don't think. But disruptability, the idea that we're willing to be inconvenienced by the people 
who we live in proximity to. Uh, I wonder, and if you're anything like me, my schedule tends to not have a lot of margin in it. Uh, I, d I don't have a lot of margin to be disrupted by the people around me. And yet the way of Jesus, I think, compels us to this posture of disruptibility where you know, he takes longer routes to destinations, he wades through crowds, he seems to believe that something really profound happens in the disruption, right? When humans encounter one another, when that collision of humanity occurs, something dynamic is, is made possible. And so I think for some of us, it's just creating enough margin to have room for those disruptions when they come up, right? When we encounter the other in the neighborhood. But I think there are some practical things uh, that maybe we can consider. One, one is walking. So I don't know where you live, but a lot of our cities and neighborhoods are, are not actually designed for walking. They're designed for cars. And when you design a place for cars, often pedestrians get missed out. And so this is something, as an aside, uh, we could nerd out about, a, about some other time. Uh, just how urban design shapes human connection. So often, depending on the place that we live in, the design of your place might be actually going against you in all of this, right? right. Trying to subvert you along the way. Uh, and so finding ways to overcome the design of our places to meet our neighbors can be a real challenge at times. But I think walking is one of those things that opens us up those, to those sensory experiences, right? We start to experience our places a little more holistically, we start to feel that attachment. We start to open ourselves up to those accidental encounters with neighbors on the sidewalks of our places. You think about uh, the, the, the modern vehicle, right? the design of the car uh, is fairly constrictive, right? It's kind of private space. When we walk, we walk through public space, like sidewalks. But the car is a, is a private space, essentially. Often we enter it in our garages, so we go from private space to private space. We drive to our work, which is, a secondary space, but it's private in the sense that the public's not typically just walking through our workplaces. And so the design of our cars paired with the speed that we drive them and the attention needed to drive them safely really keeps us from holistically experiencing the places that we're going through. Mm -hmm. And that's also an indicator of the times. I mean, at one point in time, you scale back in human history, uh, we weren't able to work and worship and play in places that are far away from the, the actual places that we inhabit and live in. And so we live increasingly fragmented lives. So f one way I think we subvert that is we, we try to walk whenever we can. It, it, it forms attachment and, and moves us closer to our neighbors in, in tangible, practical ways. Yeah, I've, and I've seen that happen, uh, particularly over the pandemic when mm. we were all kind of locked in, is that when you, you get out and have that rather regular rhythm of walking, yeah. Uh, you start to, if you do have a set time, you start seeing the same people over and over again, right? Because you yeah. recognize other people have a rhythm. Sure and it, it's, uh, it's interesting to see how those relationships, and I've heard you say something similar where the, you know, like a, maybe a friendly wave or a head nod then becomes a hello mm. or a good morning. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, as time goes on, the, the, the conversation has the potential to blossom into something more, right? Where relationships can start. It, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a relational ecosystem right. that exists in our places, and, and it's, it's been there for a long time, and sometimes we're just not aware of it, but walking is one of those things that opens us up to it. Mm -hmm. The other thing that maybe we could consider this morning is, is third places. So third places uh, is, a, is a term coined by a sociologist named Roy, uh, Roy uh, Oldenburg, Ray Oldenburg, sorry. Uh, and he wrote this book called The Great Good Place, talking about these places in our neighborhoods and cities that form human connection and make us more resilient over time as people who find one another. And so there are two uh, third places that I'd like us to consider potentially, and that is the local library and the local coffee shop. So I don't know where you live, but chances are there is a library that's drivable or walkable to you. I mean, cities try and intentionally structure it so that, that it is catching a larger group of people or coffee shops. So the library is, is one of these last bastions of third spaces where you don't exchange money for belonging. That doesn't exist in very many other spheres of life in our cities, right? You can linger there as long as you want and no one is gonna pressure you to buy anything. And so, you discover a bunch of your neighbors in the library. I live in Toronto, I live in Little Portugal uh, in Toronto, and so Parkdale Library is a few streets over. When I sit in Parkdale Library, 
I'm encountering my neighbors in very real ways. If you do that continuously over the span of years, it's amazing what becomes possible in that kind of environment. So we've got libraries, and they run great programming, and turning up to that can be one way that we foster this attachment to our places. But then there's coffee shops. How many of us like coffee? Pro-coffee group. Uh, I love coffee. Third places, like coffee shops, are some of the places where we actually discover our neighbors. So I am pretty extroverted, but I am not going to go knock on my neighbor's doors in a long line looking for connection. I will, however, sit in the same coffee shop multiple times a week over the span of years with an openness to connection in the small little moments, knowing that that cumulatively adds up to something else. Listen, there's a great historical basis for this. So I'll give you an example. When we trace back through history, when revolution is on the brink, uh, the totalitarian or the monarch, when they sense that, do you know what they do? They shut down the coffee houses. <laughs> because there's something about these spaces where we can find our neighbors, where you start to share about those deeper longings for your life in that place, or the hurts and pain and suffering that you're experiencing. You realize that you're not alone, and that has historically sparked revolutions. It played a role in the French Revolution, uh, that these places become catalysts for movement. So I'm not saying that revolution is going to break out in your coffee shop, but it might. <laughs> it might. And don't you want to be there if it does? Turning up to these places is, is, is some of the ways that we discover who we share proximity with. And then what do we do? What do we do about our place? What do we do about the needs and longings and hopes and dreams and aspirations? That long road of presence in these places can be, can be helpful in finding those people and discerning what God's up to in a place. And you get to drink really good coffee along the way too, hmm. which doesn't hurt. Yeah. I think for, for, for me personally, one of those spaces uh, in the past has been the barbershop mm. where it's a, it's a place you can go and it's not hurried, you're not in a rush, and you can argue and fight and debate about any topic. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yes, revolution. Uh, I, no, I haven't been part of one of those as of yet, but uh, some real heated yet. debate can happen. But it's a beautiful thing, right? It's an opportunity to to be seen, to be known, and to have those relationships in that third place. I like that um, mm -hmm. that description of it. Mm -hmm. And maybe um, maybe you can talk about uh, collaboration. I think we talked a little bit about like God already being at work in places. So so like collaboration with neighbors or things that are already going on. Mm -hmm. um, what what may be a good avenue yeah. to get things connected? Yeah, there, there does seem to be a bit of an instinct within the church circles that I've kind of run in, which is we need to start things, right? We like to be starters. And sometimes starting things is a good plan. We see a gap, right? There's a need in a particular community. And we have some resources and we have, uh, you know, the space to, to, to address that. But often, like you just said, turning up and offering our skills and resources and capacities to things that are already existing in our places really shapes fertile ground for collaboration. Mm. So there's really good things going on in our neighborhoods. There's people who've been toiling for a long, long time. And here's the good news as Christians, I think, that, that all good is God's good. So if that thing going on at the local library celebrates the way of Jesus in some way, justice, peace, or reconciliation, we are granted permission to participate and to celebrate and to engage well. And so sometimes we need to start things, but oftentimes we just need to turn up and then right. begin to identify in the room uh, asset-based community development. Maybe some of you have heard that phrase before, but the essential idea of it is this approach to community development that starts with what's strong, not with what's wrong. So you start with the skills and capacities that exist in that community, and then you try and leverage those in faithful ways over the span of time and trust that that's going to have residual impact. I think in these contexts for collaboration, these are the spaces where we begin to determine and discern what kind of capacities we have in our place and how those can be leveraged over time. And, so, and we know that when you work on something, think about this if you're a parent. Right? You steward a child together. Uh, there's a bond that's formed because of this joint responsibility, this shared love of this common thing. Uh, it fosters attachment to the people who are collaborating in, in that sense, right? We've probably experienced that along the way with, with a spouse or a partner. Mm -hmm. um, 
I like to say that the same thing can happen in collaborative environments, right? We not only become more attached to our neighbors there, not only do we determine and discern the gifts that people have and how those can be leveraged to seek the welfare of our place, mm -hmm. uh, not only do we discern what the Spirit's up to when we are listening and we're attentive, right. but we're also forming bonds of connection and resiliency. So when the pandemic happens, we're a known character in mm -hmm. the scope of our neighborhood, and we know others, and that forms and shapes and inspires resilience. My friends like to call, uh, the, uh, my friends at the, the New Parish, they wrote this book called The New Parish, really fascinating book, uh, kind of discusses some of these themes. They talk about neighborhoods as something that's big enough to live most of your life in, but small enough that you can become a known character within it. And I think that's a helpful framework when we talk about collaboration, when we talk about the places and spaces that we exist in. Big enough that we can live most of our life in it, but small enough that we can become a known character in it over time and know the other characters who are part of it. Yeah. And, and what is it for us to now um, seek the flourishing of our neighborhood? Like mm -hmm. we talk about, like, so yes, so we're collaborating, but what is, what is it now to, to seek the flourishing of where we live? Mm -hmm. Well, the word that's used in Jeremiah 29 is the word shalom, mm. which some of us may be familiar with. <laughs> it's a word for peace, but it's, it's more than just the absence of conflict. Okay. It's far more holistic than that. This is what it's like when God's presence descends on a particular place. And so that means a whole bunch of implications. Right? We're talking about economic and structural renewal. We're talking about arts being celebrated and economies welcoming the other. We're talking about interacting with contextual issues like housing and the, our neighbors who are underhoused, right? When God's presence descends on a place, people are housed. The trauma that comes with not being housed is undone, uh, and that's good news. Right? It's an indicator that the kingdom's breaking forth in a place. And so that peace, that well-being is pretty holistic, and it, it, it impacts our social and relational lives. It, it impacts uh, the economic systems that we create. It impacts the way that we structure ourselves and gather in a particular place. It has implications for all of it. And so I think when we start to move in that direction, again, if you're, if you're anything like me, you tend to think really big, really quickly. What are the businesses that we're going to start, the co-working spaces that we're going to initiate? How are we going to gather around assets and do the most interesting dynamic thing possible? But I'd like to suggest two things that maybe or maybe not be helpful, but I'll leave that up to you. The first is to shrink your geography. So we, we talked about the definition of, of neighborhood uh, that uh, my friends at the New Parish say, again, big enough that you can live most of your life and small enough that you can become a known character in it. Shrinking our geography, I think, is really actually liberating. Sometimes we think within boundaries, if we create a boundary, then we're stifled by that. But actually, there's a lot of freedom within boundaries because it gives us a sense of what a life of faithfulness can look like in a particular geography. So shrinking those boundaries and focusing our time and attention and resources on a particular geography can actually be really helpful and liberating, keeping us from that disappointment of things like when we say, love the city. I live in Toronto. We're talking millions and millions of people in different neighborhoods with different contextual realities. So really, all that I can do, even our faith community in downtown Toronto, the Meeting House downtown Toronto, we're not going to impact our city on the whole. We're not. And people walk away disappointed when, they think, when, when you hear that language. And I hear it in churches. They're like, we're going to change the city. No, you're not. <laughs> not even close. Um, and that's okay because there's an invitation to the particularity of our places, finding out what God's doing in those places. So shrinking our geography can be helpful. And then thinking small within that over the span of time can be helpful. Like these small acts of neighborliness in a particular place and over a long extended period of time are far more subversive and engaging and meaningful than we tend to think. So these small things really do matter. They, they subvert something that I come to a lot, which is apathetic inaction, because my ideas get so big and they scale so quick that I end up doing not a lot of anything. And I don't know if any of you have experienced that, where the scale gets so big and gets so far away from you that, that you don't really do anything about anything. 
And so that small act of neighborliness helps subvert that a bit. Uh, I also think that there's a cumulative impact to these small things. My friend uh, Tim Swarns calls this the compound interest of neighborhood presence. It's not a lovely phrase. <laughs> I like that. The idea that the small little things we do in a particular place over the span of time have this cumulative impact that in the moment seems small, but added over time and animated by the Spirit is actually pretty significant. Mm -hmm. The possibilities are, 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 are pretty profound. And so doing those things with great faithfulness in a particular geography, yeah. uh, seeking the welfare in the small ways so that, because when we're faithful in the small things, yeah. when the big things come up later down the road, after that presence, after that moving in, after that attachment, I think we'll be more likely to respond with faithfulness to those larger things uh, when we uh, get to them. I'm so glad you said that. That's good. Mm. And now even, even for context, I think, um, so your, your context is, is downtown Toronto, little Portugal. Uh, for a number of us, the context is, is the suburbs, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's my context. I, don't, I, I live in a sub, and the neighborhood design is to keep us separated in a lot of ways where we don't get to see each other. One thing that I, I've learned that's been helpful is there's a built-in thing. So living in Canada, mm -hmm. living in the suburbs, every time it snows, I see that as an opportunity to make a connection with a neighborhood um, <laughs> where you have, you have that chance to be out, because uh, we don't like to be outside, just to be able to shovel our driveways. And uh, I can remember um, so getting a chance to meet some of my neighbors, and it was a beautiful interaction. So there was, we had an older, an older uh, gentleman from Eastern Europe who lived right next to us, and we didn't really take turns. It wasn't planned, but we would go and just shovel the driveway of this, this older gentleman. And him and I, we kind of built a friendship, which was lovely. Mm. And he said something to me that was really interesting. Um, over time, I said, you know, um, his name's Mark. I said, Mark, I really appreciate that we get to do this. This, is, this feels neighborly. And his words of wisdom to me that I won't forget, he, says, he said, Quincy, it doesn't matter how big your house is or how much you pay in property tax. If you don't know your neighbors, you just live in the hood. Hmm. And I, said, I thought about that for a minute, and it stuck, right? As we, as we, we kind of think of these ways of like, uh, if it's economics or our, our so social standing, no, if, if we um, can intentionally be looking for those people of peace that mm -hmm. God, I think, has already planted or doing, if we can look and partner with them, listen to them, learn from them, and see how we can bring the flourishing to our neighborhood, it's, it does, it starts small, but it's interesting that that relationship ended up uh, blossoming into a way, and, and uh, we got to celebrate on our street his wedding, right? He actually invited me to do his wedding in his backyard in the pool, which was amazing, right? They, they didn't jump the broom, they ended, ended up jumping into the swimming pool, which is a whole other story. <laughs> but, the, but, uh, but it started from those kind of small um, neighborly acts of kindness to say, like, no, I, like, I see you, and let me create those margins where I can be able to be in your space well, and beautiful. show the peace of God. And that's you subverting a built environment that, that is trying, like you said, to keep you apart. Right. right. Embracing private property, doing things in the backyard. And it's not to say that those things are bad, but you have to go out of your way to go out the front door. It takes an intentionality. There's an intentionality sure. there. Yeah. And, and did, I think of a, a story. So I have some friends who live in another kind of suburban environment, much like this, in North uh, East London, Ontario. And so they did the same thing that you just did, which is they observed that the built environment here isn't terribly helpful when it comes to meeting people. There's not a lot of public spaces like parks. There's not co coffee shops, the things we just talked about. There's no local library. And so what they did is they began to leverage their skills in coffee uh, by uh, redesigning their garage to be a coffee space. And so uh, they had to clear out some stuff like most of us would have to do. Uh, they redesigned it. They built a nice little pour-over bar. And so Friday mornings from 7 to 10, they'd convert their garage into a coffee shop uh, and welcome their neighbors to come. And you'll, you'll see 70 people turn up on their driveway because th that just doesn't exist there, yeah. right? But it's meeting a need, right? They assess the built environment. They thought about their skills and capacities. They're good with coffee. They have this space. It's not going to be a drain in terms of energy because they like dealing with coffee and they like meeting their neighbors. And so they, in a small way, they're leveraging their time and capacities in a way that's uh, creating a ripple effect of change, right? People are finding one another so that when pandemics happen or when someone needs to be married, off, there's this network of connection that's formed over time. And here's the, 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 the neat part about that story is the thing that it cost them was the coffee beans, but they reached out to the roaster and said, can we just get the business rate? Like, we're not a business, we're just doing this little neighborhood project. And the roaster was so moved by the idea that they give them the coffee for free now. 
just because of what it's sparking in their community. Yeah. So. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. This has been great, man. This has been I nice, like, I feel like you and I can continue. We could do this. Another, another half hour, 45 yeah, yeah, yeah. minutes, two hours. <laughs> but um, but the, yeah, so I think the intention with this is to, is to hopefully inspire, um, to encourage, not to, not to guilt and say, well, now I, I'm not doing enough. You might, now I need to change. Like to your point earlier, right? It's like we can sometimes have these big ideas that get so... Uh, inflated, mm -hmm. that we just sit and, and think of what a terrible neighbor we are. <laughs> yeah. um, but instead, that just be, um, be inspired to be attentive to where we are and to recognize that we, it's not by accident we are where we, where we, are, where mm -hmm. we find ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then to, uh, to seek the flourishing of where we live intentionally in a way that um, allows the spirit to move mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. brings flourishing in our communities. It's a good word, Quincy. So let me, uh, let me bless us. There's, there's a, another passage. Anytime I hear... Um, uh, Jeremiah 29, my mind goes to, there's a, there's a familiar passage for some of us. I know it's on coffee mugs in our home and little placards and everything, but, but as an encouragement, as, as, uh, not to think about the, the next thing or why I'm not where I'm at or uh, the great by and by, but to, um, to trust that God knows the plans that he has for us, that there are plans to prosper us, and not to harm us, and plans to give us hope in a future. And that when we, call upon the, when we call upon the Lord and come and pray to him, he will listen. That when we seek him, we will find him when we seek him with all of our heart. That's my prayer for us today. Um, but let me pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity and pray uh, once again for inspiration, for attentiveness, for intention that we may uh, find you and seek you when we seek you with our heart. So I pray, Father, that as we uh, fight this thing as a, a countercultural way of, of, uh, of not just disappearing into our garages or uh, creating lives that have zero margin to interact with the people that we live next to, God, that you would uh, expand our capacity, uh, give us the um, encouragement to, and, the, and the courage to rearrange what we already have in order to make space for those holy disruptions. Bless us as we go to bring peace and flourishing in our communities. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hmm. Told ya. Amen. So much to chew on and do with. I'll remind us of a couple things, and then I just want to hit us with a takeout from uh, what we just uh, walked through. Um, if you, as you're processing this week, number one, we hope that you're part of a home church. We have uh, online home churches and also in person. Uh, so if you're part of one of our parishes or you're from around the world, please, please, we'd love to have you jump in. Um, you can go to askatthemeetinghouse.com and somebody will be in touch with you or just check out online any of our home churches. Jump in, discuss, discuss, discuss. We don't want this to just be like a monologue, but a conversation. Um, also, our Peacemakers campaign, like I said, uh, we're hearing lots of encouraging stories about how people are engaging. Our goal is $150,000 and collection day is May 29th. So hopefully you've drawn lots of inspiration uh, over this morning uh, and certainly over the weeks that come as we continue with this series, Peace Be With You and our Peacemakers campaign. Go and do likewise, brothers and sisters. Um, and then if you have any questions, maybe this is your first time and you're like, yeah, how do I get further plugged in? Or I want to like chat a little bit or have a, uh, have a question about what I just heard. Same place. You can go to ask at the meetinghouse.com. Well, brothers and sisters, we hope that you have a fantastic rest of your Sunday and that God will continue to joyfully disrupt you and invite you into what he is already doing in the places where you work, where you live and where you play. And so grace and peace to you. Much love. And we will see you next time.